Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, Romans 9, the Apostle Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh. Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So the Apostle Paul tells us here in the book of Romans chapter number 9 that he is an Israelite. Now what tribe is Paul from? Benjamin. And what two tribes uh, comprise the southern tribes and uh, the split when it, uh, under Rehoboam? Benjamin and Judah. And the, ten, and the, and the other ten tribes uh, com, uh, made up what's called Israel or the northern tribes, the northern ten tribes. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, di the division was geographical and the division was uh, religious because uh, you know what happened. Jeroboam set up a false god. He set up uh, a, a golden calf and created his own priesthood and all that to keep the people from coming to Jerusalem and worship the true God. And uh, so he did this, but he could not change their racial identity. He couldn't do that. You, can't, you can separate people all you please. They're still Israelites, or they're still Jews. Uh, to this present day, there is isn't in the world what's called the diaspora. Uh, how many know what the diaspora is? Okay, a few of you do. It's important to remember these terms because they bear directly on what's happening right now in the Holy Land. The diaspora refers to those Jews who are scattered away out of the land of Israel. They're scattered all over the world. Israel has two terms today. Israel refers either to the people of the land or the land of the people. Eretz Israel means the land. It's talking about the land that is uh, that you see in its geographical boundaries as it's known right now in 2014. That's Eretz Israel. The Hebrew word Eretz means land. But you've also got Israel as a body, a body politic, if you please. People scattered all over the earth. And they belong to its, uh, Eretz Israel. To come back to the land is what's called an aliyah. They make an aliyah or aliyah. I think some of them pronounce it that way. And they're probably more correct than I am. I'm an Englishman trying to speak Hebrew. I'll listen to a Jew in a heartbeat over somebody from London, wouldn't you? Uh, from their own language. But uh, an aliyah means that they're coming back to the land. That's what it means. It doesn't mean they're coming back to Judaism. They're coming back to the land of Israel, which of course was, was essentially an impossibility before the uh, Balfour Declaration and World War I because uh, there, was, there, there was practically nothing in the land and uh, the Jews uh, had decided uh, they didn't need to come back. Only a remnant were there. Uh, when uh, Samuel Clemens, uh, you know him by the pseudonym Mark Twain, visited that land in the 1800s, he said that it was desolate. He said the land of Israel was desolate. Now I know that uh, you're talking about a period of time 150 years ago. Unlike today, you didn't have tourist groups going to Israel. It didn't happen. You just had an occasion here and there, somebody who, who decided to go and endure the hardship. But he said that when he went into that land in the 1800s, Samuel Clemens, uh, about 1850, 60, 70, somewhere in there, he said that the land was desolate and here and there were Jews and here and there a few Arabs, very few. According to Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, the myth of Palestinians forever inhabiting that land is just exactly what it is, a myth. The reason the Jew was not in the land in the 1800s, some were, but not in force, not in number, is because they had been driven out of the land, forcibly removed from their land. And this happened in 132, 34, 35 AD, somewhere in there, when Hadrian drove the Jew from his land. 
And all the modern commentators, and CBS, NBC, ABC, and the rest of them, uh, fail to remind people that that land at one time had all belonged to the Jew and that they had been forcibly removed from their own land. And that's a fact of history. I mean, that can be proven. That's incontrovertible. All you've got to do is check into it, and it's there. So for them to come back to the land is an aliyah. And the diaspora are the Jews that are scattered throughout the world. Eretz Israel is a reference to the land of Israel. Israel, the greater terminology Israel, is a reference to all of Israel as they're scattered throughout the world. The thing to remember this morning is that regardless of where they are or who they are, they still retain their ethnic identity as Jews. Now we talked about Judaism and how important it is because it is very important, far more important than the successor of Muhammad. I told you how the Shiite and Sunni Muslim, now they've been running it across the screens in the local, or in the, in the Fox and the rest of them, CNN. They're all running uh, tickers across the bottom now talking about the separation that took place between the, the followers of Muhammad through his grandson and through his son-in-law and through his grandson, and then the followers of the Caliphate who went the other direction who formed the Sunni Muslims. So the Sunni and the Shiite separated after the death of Muhammad. And it's important to understand that as far as history is concerned and to understand where we are today in the world. But as far as importance is concerned, the Jew is infinitely more important than a Muslim. I'll say that again. He is infinitely more important than a Muslim. And so to understand the Jew is to understand our roots and understand where we came from. And so I told you that Judaism is built today, rabbinic Judaism is built today upon what's called the Babylonian Talmud. And the Talmud is built upon what's called the oral tradition that was supposedly, allegedly given by Moses, given to Moses at Mount Sinai. God gave, gave him two laws, the written law in stone, the Ten Commandments, along with the 613 other, law, other laws of the Old Testament, and then the oral law that God gave to Moses. Now, I don't believe it for a minute. I believe God gave him the written law, and he told Moses to write a book. And Moses wrote the Pentateuch. But in any event, all of rabbinic Judaism today is built upon the premise that you had a oral law given to Moses, which became the foundation for the Babylonian Talmud, which is one of the two Talmuds. You have a Jerusalem Talmud, a Babylonian Talmud, one of the two Talmuds that make up what's called or make up essentially the foundational work of rabbinic Judaism, of the rabbis today, without a temple, without a priesthood, without a sacrifice, without any of that. But Judaism is far more complicated than that. And when someone says to you, well, what does a Jew believe? What Jew? When somebody says, what does a Jew believe? You, you need to define your term. Who are you talking about? You have Kairite Jews who refuse the rabbinic Judaism, they refuse the Babylonian Talmud, and they accept only the Old Testament. Good for them. That's a Kairite Jew. Good for them. Then you have Jews that go off into mysticism and they accept the Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah is based upon the Zohar. And the Zohar is an ancient text that grew out of Hinduism and the occult world and so therefore, mystical Judaism is based upon the occult world, the world of Helen Blavatsky, of Theosophy. Mystical Judaism has taken root in Hollywood, and a lot of the uh, stars and starlets and, uh, and the rest of them out there apparently feel like, uh, you know, how they, it's, it's, it's in vogue, it's, it's, it's here, it's cool, it's something to do, so they're all they're subscribing to the Kabbalah. The reason they do is because they're introduced to a spirit world. And a lot of those people out there are hungry for something spiritual. Believe me, they've got all kinds of money and bought everything money can buy, and they're still miserable. And so they're, they're playing around with, spirit, with the spirit world through the, through the Kabbalah, and they get into mysticism, they get into spirit guides, they get into the chakras. To the, in, in, in Kabbalism, it's called the tree of life. They get into all this stuff, and it begins to feed their hunger for something spiritual. But what they don't realize is that they're getting into demonism in the process of doing that. So the Jew's a mixed bag. The Jew can give you oral tradition. He can give you the Kabbalah. He can give you the Talmud. Or he can give you the Word of God. 
And Romans chapter number 9 says, To the Jew was committed the oracles of God. Now, when it says oracles of God, what do you think that means? The Word of God. Exactly. God committed it to the Jew. He didn't commit it to the Gentile. He didn't commit it to the Muslim. He committed the oracles of God to the Jew. And why did He do that? He did that 1400 years before Christ to authenticate these people as the source of light and truth to the world. When the Lord met the woman at the well in John 4, who was a, who was a uh, Samarian, Samaritan, He said to her, Salvation is of the Jews. Well, they had Mount Gerizim. And that's what she said. She said, we worship at Mount Gerizim. Well, Mount Gerizim has a synagogue on top of it. And they offer sacrifices, blood sacrifices at the top of Mount Gerizim. And they have a, ta they have a, pen they have a Pentateuch. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And it's very similar to the Hebrew or the Jewish Pentateuch, but it's not the same. It, uh, it, 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 it diverges. It, it, there's a difference in between the two. But it is, it is very valuable historically because it is ancient to show you how that the Hebrew Old Testament is fixed. It's just like that 57 foot long scroll of Isaiah they found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know then that was, and that dates about 250, maybe 300 BC. And you're only talking about 700 BC when Isaiah was written, 400, 450 years removed from the original writing. And we have, we have with that uh, authentication that we've got the book, we've got the truth. And so these, these, these Samaritans at the top of that mountain, have a, they have a synagogue, they have a, they have a sacrifice, uh, they have a temple, a, a sacrifice, a Pentateuch, and all of that. But that's not where God put His truth. He put His truth in Jerusalem with the Jew. And so the Lord said to the, to, the, to, the, to the Samaritan woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. He said, you worship, you know not what. So when you think about what's come forth from the Jews, I think you, if you'll look at it this morning, you begin to understand where we are. We are in America in a cafeteria. We live in a spiritual cafeteria. That's where we are. It's not a restaurant. It's not a restaurant. So what's the difference? You have to be able to read the menu in a restaurant. When you go through a cafeteria line, you just look and say, oh, I like that. That looks good. Get that? That looks good. Man. That looks good. That's the average American. He doesn't have enough sense to read the menu. He has to be spoon fed. So he goes through the cafeteria line. And religion in America now is cafeteria style. Well, I like this. Uh, this. I like this part from Judaism. I like this over here from Hindu. This I like this part of Buddhism. I like this little bit of tidbit from Christianity. And I like this Muslim prayer call. I like that. That sounds good. And I like this, and I like that. And, I like, and when you get to the end of the line, you take your tray and say, oh, I don't know how much it cost. Your soul. <laughs> you willing to pay that much for it? <laughs> That's what it'll cost. Your soul. So you'll know the truth, and the truth will do what? I have, a, I have an enormous responsibility, folks, as the pastor. And the longer I live, the more it bears on my soul to teach you the truth. I spend my days studying and researching and digging into this stuff and trying to find out what the, what, what, where the direction is, where it's headed, and what's going on. For example, heresy rising Christian pastors embracing New Age syncretism. There's a lot of big words here, but syncretism simply means a merging together. See? All right, go through the cafeteria, pick this out, pick that out, pick this. This is my tray full. The fellow sitting next to you has his tray full. When I went in the Marine Corps, you know how we went through the cafeteria line? We went like this. And when we got to the first place in line, we had our, we had our tray up like this, and drill instructor was watching us. And when we got to the first place, we didn't know what they put on that. When I got to the end of the line, that's what I ate. <laughs> <laughs> You don't go through the line and say, I'd like to have a little bit of this over here. I'll give me some of this. No. <laughs> Not in boot camp. It doesn't work that way. Well, that's, that's a different cafeteria. Now when you don't go through the line, if you're a born-again believer, you say, Lord Jesus, feed me. I want the truth. I want the truth. 
So New Age syncretism, notice New Age syncretism, pastors are embracing this. Now, there's always a source to everything. You know, the well, the source. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beginning, there's a root. Somebody coined the term, somebody coined the term that a woman should have power over her own body, uh, pro-choice. Somebody coined that term. I never heard that term when I was 17 years old. But somewhere later on it showed up. See, they coined the phrase. They created this terminology for the, Ameri for the English language. Uh, pro-choice. I'm pro-choice. Believe me, I am. Let the baby make a choice, and I'm happy about it. Amen. Well, the baby has to be born to do that. You got the point. <laughs> How many of them born would you think choose to die? But anyway, three years ago, Pastor Woodall and his flock seceded. Yeah, seceded from the United Methodist Church, lost their building, and had to transfer their worship services to a small, struggling Baptist church nearby. The United Methodist Church dismissed Woodall from its ministry, and he soon dropped out of a legal battle over possession of the church building. Now, of course, I'm sure they paid tithe and kept the building up, and they felt like it belonged to them. Might have, you know, who's been, whatever. But anyway, why did he leave the United Methodist Church? Because he said, quote, the denomination was rife with paganism and anti-biblical practices, same-sex unions, homosexual ordination, Sophia worship, put that away there, Sophia worship, goddess worship, Wicca worship, you know what Wicca is, what's Wicca? That's exactly right. Pagan practices, anti-Trinitarianism, opposition to the virgin birth and the deity of Christ, as reported on the United Methodist Church's own website. Now, don't you think that's quite remarkable that a church, quote unquote, church, would call itself a Christian church and practice that? But that didn't happen overnight. The infiltration of Sophia. Now, who's Sophia? That's a feminine form of sophos. And that means wisdom, the wise one. Okay. Sophistry is the study of wisdom. Soph uh, uh, philosophy is the lover of wisdom. And on it goes. The church of Hagia Sophia over there in Istanbul, Turkey. Sophia is one of the emanations from the divine light, from the pleroma. Remember? Lucifer, Sophia, Jesus, on it goes, are emanations not created beings. An emanation is a presence that we creatures can comprehend. We can't comprehend anything deeper than that because when it gets to that divine mind that Plato talks about, that pleroma, that oneness, that, 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 that super intelligence is just beyond physical comprehension. So that intelligence makes itself known through emanations. And Sophia is one of these. Now you understand, please. I don't believe a bit of that. I'm trying to tell you that that's what they believe. And so they're worshiping Sophia. Notice how in 2014, with jet aircraft and going to the moon and cell phones, that people are worshiping Sophia. Why do they worship Sophia? Because they don't want to waste their time with a demiurge, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah of the Old Testament, <coughs> I'm not going to waste my time with him. I have spirit guides that are taking me far higher than the Old Testament could ever take me. So I'm plugged into Sophia. That's exactly what's happening to these churches. They're plugging into the divine wisdom. And that's exactly where the Hindu has been, the Kabbalah has been for centuries. They're bypassing scripture and they're going straight to that wisdom, to that light. And of course, Lucifer is a Latin term. And what does it mean? It means light bearer. Isaiah chapter 14, the Hebrew word is halal, a bright morning, shining one. And so they translate that into English as Lucifer. And we come along today and they say, well, as a mistake, Lucifer is a good thing. 
He's a good being. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. If he is, why does every cult and every dirt dog and everything in the world that wants to be anti-God and anti-Christ, why does it take the name Lucifer? And the reason it does is because of the spirit that's involved with it. Because it's not the thing itself, it's the spirit behind it. You can put a poster of Lucifer in here. The poster's nothing. It's just a poster. But what it brings forth is the issue. So you've got to be careful about your signs and symbols that you put inside a church. This is why the old-fashioned Baptist worshipped in brush arbors. The only thing they saw was a branch or a leaf or a log or something like that. They didn't see any of these symbols. These symbols. You've got to watch them. You've got to watch the five-pointed star, the pentagram. You've got to watch it. You've got to watch the star of David. You do a little research into it and be awful careful when you do. But it may very well be talking about the God Rem fan that he's talking about in the Old Testament. And he called him the, the, the star of your God Rem fan. You've got to be careful. This thing, it, it, symbols we don't, we don't have in the church. The only symbol that we have in this church, in the church of God, is that cross. Amen. That's the only thing. And there's about three or four different types of crosses. There's the cross of St. Andrew like this, up in Scotland, the white background, that cross, blue on a white background. You've got that cross. You put the cross of, uh, of uh, St. Patrick on top of it, red cross. Then you put the cross of St. George on top of that, like this, very similar to this one, like this. And you've got what's called the Union Jack. You know what the Union Jack is? That's the British flag. Most folks don't realize that it's made up of three separate crosses. The reason for that is because Ireland, Scotland, and England are brought together to create the United Kingdom. And that's where you've got. Did you want to say something, brother? No. Okay. So the Union Jack. Yes, sir. You can almost see the devil at work, though, because you know, Solomon referred to wisdom as a woman. You say wisdom cries. Yes, sir, brother. Voice in the streets. She is more precious than rubies. Yes. You see the devil trying to twist that, turn that into a Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, in, the book of, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about wisdom personified. And the wisdom personified is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's that wisdom personified. The Lord Jesus Christ, when He showed up 2,000 years ago, folks, is the wisdom of God. And that manifestation of the wisdom of God is quite a thing when you begin to look at it. But in any event, when you bring these three together, you create the Union Jack. And that is representative of Ireland, St. Patrick, who was a Christian, no question about it. No question about it. St. Patrick was a Christian. Uh, uh, tradition says that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland, along with a lot of other traditions. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they say to this day there aren't any snakes in Ireland. I know some two-legged snakes, amen. <laughs> not on the ground. And then you have St. Andrew, like this, St. Andrew's cross, the, uh, the Confederacy in the, in the battle, uh, the Civil War, took St. Andrew's cross, like this right here, and put, made it a battle flag uh, that they fought under. And St. Andrew's cross uh, has been, is used to this very day in a lot of other places and for different things. St. Andrew, of course, was Andrew the what? The Apostle. He was, tradition says, Tradition says that Andrew was crucified on a cross like that, like that. Tradition says that the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. Tradition, not the Bible. Say, is tradition wrong? Not necessarily, but don't take it as Scripture. Tradition may be right, but it, you, can't, you can't build doctrine on it and stand on it. See, that's, so you just take that with a grain of salt. It may be true. And, uh, but in any event, St. George is the one who slew the dragon cross like this. And the dragon, you say, well, there's no such thing as dragons. You kidding? That's right. You go through every culture on this earth That's right. and everywhere you go, they have right. depictions of dragons. Right. Why would they have that if they're totally unrelated to each other, have no connection, thousands of miles apart? Right. It's like the signs of the Maseroth up in the heavens when you've got all these stars up there. You go out at night and look at them. I can't make a pattern out of them. But you can go across the earth around uh, around to, to, to all places, places where men have lived on this earth, and anywhere they have a sign of the zodiac, their signs are practically identical. 
Why? Because there was an ancient wisdom transmitted to them from generation to generation. The truth has been transmitted to us in the Word of God. This is why they said in the book of Jeremiah, be not dismayed with the signs of the heavens or with the signs of the stars in the heavens. The, biggest, the easiest way to control a person is keep them dumb. The easiest way to control people is to dumb them down. The easiest way to control someone is to spoon feed them and get them to where they, they no longer have an analytical mind. They can no longer differentiate things. They can no longer search a thing out for themselves. And they're fed constantly by a tube that's flashing before their eyes. And all they know is what they're getting fed through that TV screen. That's killing us. That's killing us. And that's killed the church. The church today now has begun to embrace foreign gods, pagan gods. And these gods have been around for a long time. <coughs> this, this preacher said that he has left the United Methodist Church. I'm simply telling you what Pastor Woodall says and his flock, <coughs> that they can no longer stay in that church. It says, the infiltration of Sophia, the false goddess of wisdom, has polluted many of our mainline Christian churches in our present time. Now listen to this. Acceptance of Sophia, false doctrine, in the United Methodist Church is being followed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Presbyterian Church USA, and even the Southern Baptist Convention. Fifty years ago, some of the finest preachers on this earth were Southern Baptist preachers. They were. I got saved in a Southern Baptist church. I was licensed to preach in a Southern Baptist church. My pastor was a Southern Baptist pastor who was faithful to the Word of God, who loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and preached the truth every day of his life. And I'm not telling you this morning that the whole Southern Baptist church is, is, is headed in that direction. No, because there are a lot of independent fundamental Baptists out there right now who have embraced contemporary Christian music whose roots run straight into demonism and the occult world. Independent fundamental Baptist churches. So I'm not up here this morning bashing Southern Baptists, but I have a responsibility to tell you that the corruption is moving, it's seething, it's spreading into the churches, and we've got to be aware of what's going on. No, all Southern Baptist churches are not like that. There are some that I watch on television, some of the preachers I watch on there that aren't too far from here that are fine, outstanding men of God, and they preach the truth of God's Word. And I'll say that in a heartbeat. So no, I'm just simply saying this as a fact that, that there is a problem there, just like there's a problem in the fundamental independent Baptist church. What does it say? It says that the church itself as a whole is going down. And we must be aware of where it's headed. Most churches, most churches, the first element to move into a church, to apostatize it and drag it down is through the music. You've got to be very careful the kind of music that you bring into your church. In Ezekiel chapter number 28, Satan is a musical instrument. And for, we have every reason to believe that in the beginning when God made him, he made him as the leader of the choir of heaven that worshiped God. Brought, uh, glorified God. We have re every reason to believe that. He said, you are on the holy mountain of God. The pipes and tabrets and all these things were your covering. That's what you were. But you became corrupt. And because of the corruption, he fell. So uh, my, pop, my responsibility is to warn you that uh, uh, what's happening. In some of these meetings, they use very explicit terminology about Sophia and about their relationship to her. It becomes very uh, 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 one, of the, one of the words in, in the New Testament translated love is eros. And the word eros is, is, uh, is as opposed to agape as it possibly can be. Eros, eros is totally physical. It's physical love. And this is the thing that they, they, they get into this when they get into this Sophia worship. It crosses the line and it's no longer a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing that is manifested through the physical i got to be careful what the words I choose in here this morning. We've got young people. But what I'm trying to tell you is that what's going on today with the worship of Sophia goes right straight back to the fertility religions of the Canaanites. And, and if you don't know what that was, just go home this afternoon and look it up. 
and it was some of the most some of the most uh, 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 some of the worst debauchery that a human being could possibly be involved in. And this is the kind of stuff that's going on when they have these seminars and they come together in Sophia worship and praising this feminine deity. Uh, imagine how a male would do that. Uh, if you want to do this this afternoon, go home and look up the, that, that uh, obelisk up there in Washington, D.C. and the womb on the Capitol that lies, sets apart from it, and ask yourself a question. What do these two things represent? And take the Vatican with its womb and its obelisk that came out of Egypt, and, and, uh, and, and super, uh, what do you call it? superimpose that over the top of Washington, D.C., and you'll begin to understand the kind of foundation that was laid when they started this country when they laid out, a Frenchman laid out the road system in Washington. He laid all that out. There is an occult message going on up there and has been for a long time. And it's not a coincidence and it's certainly no accident. But it didn't start there, folks. Uh, we're young. America is a baby. We're babies still in diapers when it comes to this kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about places that have been around for thousands of years the great, 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 great granddaddy of everything that ever went on in America was hatched and born long ago out here in this world. We're babies and diapers in this country when it comes to this. But the church has supposed to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Light in the sense that it gives the world direction, salt in the sense that it gives the world preservation. But that's, that's changing now. Religious tolerance now becomes the foundation of, uh, of the military. The military now has, has taken under Obama, but it wasn't stri uh, simply under Obama. It started before him. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't blame the Democrat for everything. <laughs> right. Right. I know some Republicans like to do that, but you can't do that. Right. If you want, I'll say one more time. Both parties are rife with corruption, right. shot through with, with devil worshipers. Right. And, 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 and I'm not going to get up here and trumpet the Republican Party uh, for a minute over the Democrat Party. No way. I'm not about to do it. Uh, this is not a Republican pulpit and it's not a Democrat pulpit. I want the truth. And if a politician will stick to the truth, I'll support him. But if he won't, I'm done with him. Uh, but we live in a time of religious tolerance and you're going to come under more pressure, more pressure uh, because of religious tolerance. Let me give you one illustration of how that works. The Department of Human Services, the DHS, all right, under the, uh, for the last 30 to 40 years has grown into an enormous, enormous uh, uh, entity with enormous power. They can come and take your children away from you, just like the Internal Revenue Service. They don't even have to go to a court. They can, they can, they can come. Uh, we have this, we have this, uh, we have this uh, emergency and we've got to get these kids out of it and then we'll go to court and we'll find out. We'll, we'll work it out later. Wait till the day comes, and they're already doing this through the American Psychiatric Association. Wait till the day comes when they redefine what is sane and insane. That's right. Wait till the day comes when they define a person who is dogmatic in their faith, who is a dedicated Christian, who believes that Christ is the only way to heaven, and there is no other way. Wait till the day comes when they officially say, you are unstable. You do not have a clear mind and they can take your children away from you and take them out of your house and take them away from your home and take them out here and, and take them somewhere else. Now remember what I told you last week about Schaefer. I can't remember what her first name is. A, a, a representative a state senator from Georgia. She started digging into this child trafficking and she got deep into it and she found out that there's a lot of devilment going on that money's being made and that these kids are being sold to pedophiles, pervert groups, sold into prostitution, sold into, God forbid, child sacrifice. All kinds of stuff is happening. These kids are coming up missing. And she got into that and she realized that some, she had just touched the tip of the iceberg and it was an overwhelming thing. 
and she wound up dead. Allegedly killed by her husband, murder-suicide, which nobody believes. They murdered that woman because she got too deep into it. So when the government gets out of hand, and it's going to be there, and it's already headed in that direction, because the American Psychiatric Association, a few years ago, say 50, 60 years ago, labeled homosexuality as a deviant lifestyle. They labeled it as deviant. In other words, it was not abnormal, see? So it fell under that category. But now they've completely changed their position on that. Say, so, well, no big deal. It's a big deal. Because the courts rule according to what the professional psychiatrist says. The courts dic are dictated. They're the ones who do the, to, who do the research and, 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 and are the officers of the court. And so you're coming up against a system that has already labeled you as a fanatic. And they're already saying that. The politicians are saying that. Label you as a fanatic. Label you as incompetent. Label you as off your rocker, your mind. And therefore, they can take your children away from you. And they'll do it. And they'll do it in a heartbeat. And let me say this to you folks as plainly and simply as I know how. You can have your car. You can have your house. You can have your job. You can have all your stuff piled up around you. But if you've lost your children, you've lost it all. You've lost it all. As far as this world's concerned, you've lost it all. And they can do that. So religious tolerance, they're laying the seeds for it. First, they probably educate the public. I guess you could call it educate the public. They brainwash the ones who've been dumbed down. And they, they, they prepare them for what's coming. Religious tolerance. Here's what they're teaching. They're teaching that religions are all legitimate and valid. Religions teach multiple truths, all valid. Religious, religions converge on a single truth. Religious truths are relative. Religious truths are different responses to the divine. Religion, religious diversity is to be valued. Now, every one of these statements are contrary to Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But I'm afraid that the, the, uh, the, the uh, mainline denominations in America, the mainline Christians, so forth, uh, have embraced it. Now, how many of you have heard of the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown? Yeah. All right. Now, you've heard me say so much about Sophia. Listen to this carefully. Here are the subplots in the Da Vinci Code in the book that was wildly successful. Within a year and a half of its publication, it had sold 7.5 million copies. So Mr. Brown does not want for money. Here are, the, here are the subplots. The sacred feminine in religion. Who do you think that'd be? Sophia. Jesus' marriage to Mary Magdalene, who he selected to be the leader of the church. Mary's flight to Europe, where she remarried. The legend of the Holy Grail, which is often believed to be the search for the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper, is in reality the bloodline of Jesus and Mary. Descendants of Jesus Christ, some of them whom are alive today. Are you listening? Constantine's role in creating and molding Christianity. The invention of the deity of Jesus in the fourth century, common era, by the church. Suppressed gospels, the Gnostic gospels and so forth. A secret group called the Priory of Sion, who passed the truth about Jesus and Mary through the use of secret codes and symbols. Isaac Newton and Leonardo da Vinci were members. Leonardo da Vinci's religious symbolism, which he embedded in some of his paintings, The Last Supper, the Virgin of the Rocks. The role of Opus D or Die within the Roman Catholic Church. The number PHI and the Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence of numbers. The murder of the curator of the Louvre in Paris, France, and the search for a killer, etc., etc. These are all intriguing things. You take the average American, the average American now. He doesn't know squat. He doesn't know the Bible. He's never read scripture. And he hears all, he's heard about Jesus, no doubt. He's heard about Mary Magdalene. He's heard about these things. But all of a sudden, he's, he has a book that puts this story together and creates this world that Dan Brown 
put on paper in this book, and he gets carried away with it. Now, if you believe all this, would you be ready for the mark? You better believe you would. You'd be ready for the mark of the beast. You'd be ready for it. You know, our announcers on TV here locally, the local announcers, have been talking about chips. One of them said, good night, why don't we just put a chip in the hand and we can keep up with people. The other one said, that's a good idea. Now, are they completely ignorant? Yeah. Somebody a few years ago said they're talking heads. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's a pretty derogatory thing, but the more I listen to them, the more I have to say, that's about what they are, talking heads. They don't have a sense. They don't have any sense at all. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't have a clue. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 that the beast, the Antichrist, has a mark that they put in the forehead or in the hand. Isn't that amazing? I went to the store a couple of days ago to get a, a, a container of fruit. Container of fruit. It had all kinds of different fruit in it. So they had two of them there. And I picked it up and looked at it. And I said, I like this. I'm going to take it to the house. And I said, well, let me see how much it cost. I turned it around and looked at it. $6.66. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the other one. $6.56. Guess which one I took? <laughs> That's twice I've done that. I went to a store a couple of years ago and my bill was $6.66. I said, uh uh. I was at the counter, I said, put this on there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how opposed I am to the number 666. I want no part of it. I want no part of it in any shape, size, or form. I want no part of 666. Yes, sir. Dan Brown, uh-huh. Dan Brown, and uh, I know it's the whole time group. Yeah, Van Ampey does a lot of research. No question about it. He's... Yes, sir. We were down here at Woodseed all of a few weeks ago, and I told Carolyn about the last thing this morning. I said, I don't know if this is what. I said, look on the floor. He's here already. She had 666, and about one inch or two inch later, I'll be on the floor here. Boy, that's remarkable. That's blatant in your face. Right. I mean, she's letting people know which side she's uh, taken. That's her mark. 666. Well, I don't want any part of it. I don't, I don't want any part of 666. You can forget it. Forget me when you come to that. Because I believe the Bible. We've run out of time. Uh, I'll pick it up again next week. I hope I can bring some of this stuff together for you and make a little sense out of this senseless world. It's insane out there, and it's not getting any better. No. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray you'd bless your word now and for those who hear it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.